In this episode, I am joined by David Johnson, meditation teacher and author of A Path to Nibbana, a complete meditation guide to Twim. David shares details about the life of his recently deceased teacher, Bante Vimala Ramsey, including their first meetings in the 1970s meditation scene, the last days of Bante Vimala Ramsey's life, and the consequences of his death for the religious organization he left behind. David recounts his own life story, including 20 years of meditation in the Vipassana movement, and a detailed description of how he achieved its version of stream entry. David explains how practicing Bhante Vimala Ramsey's teachings showed to him that the stream entry achieved through Vipassana meditation is merely a mental blackout, and explains how to achieve true awakening through the practice of TWIM. David also defines enlightenment, discusses psychic city powers, and questions the enlightenment of revered figures such as Deepa Ma, suggesting their attainments were much less than widely believed. So without any further ado, David Johnson. David Johnson, welcome to the podcast. Steve, it's been a long time coming. I'm happy to be here. Oh, me too. It has been a long time coming. And we first made contact when you suggested Delson Armstrong as a ah. guest for this podcast. And uh, I, of course, accepted that suggestion and have had so many wonderful interviews with Delson. Since then, I think viewers will be aware of that. If they're not, then really, I must recommend. Oh, um, no, they're, I've seen them all. They're great. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And also, uh, Bante Vimala Ramsey, mm -hmm. uh, your late teacher. And mm -hmm. I also interviewed him on the podcast, and that was also a marvelous yeah. episode. Uh, but of course, David, you have not escaped <laughs> my, my dragnet huh. okay. of, of enlightened, okay. enlightened beings. <laughs> You know, it's one thing that's funny that Bonte Vilma Ramsey, I, I was there, I, I was down in this other room we were recording in, and, you uh, you know, I, I said, okay, Steve's going to interview you, and I think it, it, it went on and on, and I don't think he really said much about the practice, and I said, Bonte, talk about the practice, and I was hoping there would be a part two to that, but, uh, yeah, there wasn't, but part two appeared to be Delson, so that was that was great. Yeah, you put Delson forward and you facilitated that interview with Bante Vimla Ramsey. And for both of those, I'm very grateful to you. But now you're here in your own right. And I've been petitioning you for an interview for, for I don't know, maybe it's been a couple of years. I'm very pleased to have you here. You've written a wonderful book, Path of Nibbana, which we're going to talk about today, as well as your life. So thank you, David, for all you've uh, facilitated previously. And I'm so pleased to be talking with you here today. Sounds good. Let's let's get going. Okay. We mentioned Bante Vimla Ramsey, and mm. I'd like to start first off with my condolences on the passing of your teacher, Bante Vimla Ramsey Mahatera. In fact, you were his mm. uh, close assistant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering if you could say a few words to begin about the, that last period of his life, um, his passing, and, and the effect that this has had on the Damasuka community. Well, um... Bonte passed on June 27th at about, we think that it's 12.20 a.m. in the morning. And what happened, he he had, he had was in a nursing home, and he, he wasn't eating, and his health was just kind of deteriorating. And I had gone in that day to see him, and he says, you know, I don't really feel good. And, and I talked to nurses there, and I thought, well, you know, it's just... It's just he didn't feel good that day. But then I got a call that he's not doing well, and they sent him to the hospital. And so he was in the hospital, actually, I mean, June 25th or 26th, or 25th probably. He was in the hospital for a few days and got worse and worse. And pretty much they said, well, you know, he's on his way out, and we're just going to go into hospice mode. We, we don't want to, you know, uh, make any more you know, uh, injections or, or opening up this or that. It's just time for him to go. And, and so we said, okay. So he came back to the nursing home and went into hospice. Basically, we had there's a, a team of people that came in and stayed with them 
And uh, this was from the outside service. And plus, we were doing that too. And we had a couple monks here that were on retreat. And they came and they did some chanting. We even played Bonte's talks to kind of remind him. He was not, he was kind of in a coma at that point. He, he gradually lapsed into a coma. And you could tell he was listening. And um, it really benefited him by um, hearing those talks. And then uh, the day before he died, Delson went in and he read the Chichaka Sutta, which is the six sets of six. It's a very powerful sutta about seeing that everything is impersonal and just let go. There's, there's no need to hold on. And he read that whole sutta for it took an hour. And it appeared that Bhante was getting it. And Delson said, yeah, he's really in a great space right now. He's listening. And so um, we left and um, somebody sat with him till 11. And then they said, well, okay, we're leaving. And I think at that point, um, Bhante realized, okay, you know, it seems like when people die, they want to just do it on their own. I've heard that a few times. And at I think 1220, I had I was back at the center in my cabin and I was asleep, but at 1220 I woke up and I swear there was somebody in this room. It was back in this corner over here. And I woke up out of a sleep and I there was movement. This has never happened before. And I thought, is there somebody there? And I turned the light on, nobody was there. And I thought, I think Bonte died. And so the next day, um, there was actually nobody there during the night. And they said, well, they went in and he was gone. And um, they said that they didn't really know the time of death, but it was 5.30 that they found him. But I said, I think I know the time of death. Delson also had the same, he had a lot of energy that night. We had the meditators here. They were all waking up at, around midnight. And they said something woke us up. And it was very interesting. So that happened. And then we went in and Bhante uh, Kusala and another monk who were here with us uh, on retreat went in and did some uh, ceremonies over his body at the nursing home. And uh, Delson said that that was very important that the the energy stays around the body for maybe six or eight hours and at that point uh the energy said left and um uh, it was very important to keep those the suttas the wholesome things that they were saying keep his mind in an uplifted space so he could just go on and so that happened, and then he was taken, and uh, cremation was done, and we're building a, a stupa to memorialize uh, his uh, ashes. And I'll say the next day was very interesting because it was a clear day, and there's some clouds came, a little bit of clouds here and there, and there was this ring around the sun it, in a rainbow. There was a rainbow around the sun. Have you ever seen a rainbow around the sun? I haven't. And there was this kind of this formation, and it almost looked like some sort of angelic, I don't know, it's on our website, it's on our, um, it's in our, our email that we sent out. But everybody, I, I went out my cabin, I, I saw everybody looking up at the sky. And I, and they said, Oh, it's Bonte, it's got to be Bonte. So well, I don't know, but I've never seen that before. And then after that, uh, everything kind of came back to normal. Um, yeah, Bonte, I served with Bonte from, I met him in, I actually met him. I mean, that's part of my own history. Mm -hmm. In 1975, um, I had decided after college that college wasn't doing anything for me. And I left and I went and did a, a Vipassana insight uh, meditation retreat in Colorado and uh, it was 30 days and back in those days 30 days was like the the amount of time it's a long time but the guy doing it was very he was very severe and so he got up at you know four and went to bed at 
12 and kind of walked around half tired most of the time, but nonetheless, we did that. So uh, after that, uh, I then joined him at his meditation center in um, San Jose, and I became his copia, his attendant. So I've done this attendant thing twice. And he says, oh, I'm, in, I'm naming you Ananda. I said, well, that sounds good. Because I took care of him. I did everything. I even cooked at the center. And this place was called Still Point Institute. And it was interesting because it was a real um, um, melting pot of various um, uh, teachers that came through. I mean, you've heard of Joseph Goldstein, uh, Jack Cornfield, um, Manindra, uh, Manindra, their teacher. Uh, I cooked for Manindra. I love Manindra. He was wonderful. He was always in white. We we called him the ice cream cone man. He, he was always like, looked like a, a, some ice cream walking around. And he said, oh, everything's all light. It's all light. I says, is it all right or all light? Uh, so we had fun with him during that time. And um, eventually that center closed. Now, well, well uh, backing up. So Bonte... Um, came to the door one day and said, oh, I'm, I hear you're doing Vipassana here. I, I want to do a retreat. So he came in about 1975, did a retreat, and he said, I want to stay. And so he stayed there. Uh, he was a carpenter, a great carpenter. And he built our meditation center in the back uh, in San Jose in this beautiful structure with stained glass and white carpets and all of that. And so he was there, and the center closed a few years later because – well, this is like 1979, 78, and disco was coming, and white powder was the thing, and uh, meditation couldn't keep up with that stuff. Meditation was a 60s and a 70s thing. Disco was in. People were going to have fun now, and this is a whole generation that came in. We did our last Vipassana retreat with one person. And the teacher there says, you know what, I think I think it's over. He sold the house. He went to San Francisco. I got a job in Silicon Valley. Uh, Bonte, he was not Bonte. He was a lay person. He went to San Francisco and built houses. And big houses. Actually became a millionaire. And then a few years later, he decided millionaire just wasn't what it was cracked up to be. And he went to Asia. Now, the interesting story about him is that he had he had sold everything that he owned, packed it all up, went to the YMCA, which he was prone to do. And it's where he worked out and got showers and things. And he went in there and he 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 went back to get a towel in another room and he came back and his stuff was all gone. His passport, his money, his clothes his luggage, and he was on the way to the San Francisco airport. It's all gone. So I said, well, I guess it's not time. And he went back to work, <laughs> did it all again, and uh, then finally went to Asia for 12 years. And I completely was, I had lost track of him. Um, no, nobody really knew what he was doing. The students kind of lost track of him. But he was over in Asia doing what he was at uh, in Burma, pretty much in Burma. He started in Thailand, went to Burma. And he uh, became uh, became a monk and did many, many retreats in the Burmese uh, Mahasasayada tradition in Vipassana. So after a while, he decided it just, he, he said, you know, I did everything that they told me to do. They said that I achieved everything. But just something missing. So he left. He went to Malaysia. And then he met a, a guy by the name of Venerable Punaji. And Punaji, uh, a very big monk in Malaysia at the time, who's since passed as well, he said, you know, I think the problem that you're having is you're not looking at the suttas. You need to go back to the suttas. The Sudhimaga is all well and good, but it was written 1,500 years after the Buddha uh, uh, died. So maybe the practices that you're doing maybe don't match the suttas. Maybe go back to the suttas and check that out. And, and he did. And he found that things were different. And he found a whole different practice in there 
And he started teaching loving kindness and metta. And that's the basis of his practice today, the Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation. And that in the suttas, it says that not only can you attain Nibbana with breath in the Anapanasati Sutta or the Satipatthana Sutta, but you can attain it through metta, karuna, mudita, upekka, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. When you develop the mind with loving kindness, it automatically goes through all of those, uh, all of that pathway. And the, the end result is a super quiet mind where all of those feelings disappear and now you're in a complete quiet and you're now just letting go of everything that arises and then the mind stops. And that's the process and it's talked about in a number of suttas. So he found a completely different way and he's been since practicing that way. And I met him again in 2006 when somebody said, hey, I'm writing a book on uh, Manindra, Merka Naster in Berkeley. Uh, do you know anything about, about Bonte? Um, uh, he, and I said, I, oh, I don't know a Bonte. I only know knew his layperson name. But she says, well, there's this monk in Missouri that know, knows you. And then I found out it was indeed Bonte. And he had a funny website, which said something about smiling. And I said, what has he gotten himself into now? Well, I got a hold of him and he says, well, I did all of that breathing and all of this stuff. And I think I got something better and it's in the suttas. And so I tried it and I agreed. It seemed to be better than what I'd experienced. And I went from there. And I so I um, did a retreat with them and gradually um, moved out here in 2010. And I've been here ever since helping to build uh, the center. I uploaded the first videos of Bonte in 2007, I think from this little video camera, it was kind of shaky. Uh, there was no YouTube, no Google videos, there's nothing. There was MySpace and there was, you know, really old sites and um, that we, that are not even there anymore. But I was uploading like crazy. I was. I was burning CDs and DVDs with talks from Bonte and we would mail those out. Um, and gradually that all just disappeared for internet streaming, uh, like, you know, now. Um, and then I started filming and I made hundreds of YouTube videos of talks and uh, on YouTube and, you know, uh, put our, put all of information that we have on Facebook, on, you know, all of the social media stuff. So I've been here uh, managing retreats, um, helping Bonte, and now managing it on my own, uh, hosting people like Delson and Drew Litchie and, and myself. Uh, I've done some retreats. I'll be doing a few more this year. And that's kind of my story. Very interesting indeed. And uh, thank you for recounting that. And there are some more aspects of your story I'd like to ask about. But while we're on the topic of yeah. Bante Vimla Ramsey, when you think of him now, you've known him a long time. You met him, as you said, in the 70s when he was 28 years old. That's you... right. And he was he was very cool looking. He was very stylish, mm. uh, you know, in that hippie kind of tradition. He had this kind of Indian shirt on. He had beads on, um, cool glasses at times. Um, during that time, um, we went up to San Francisco. I, I, we met Mahasa Sayadaw. He came here and he did a, an alms round with his monks. I presented him with an electric shaver. They were kind of really amazed at that. This is 1980. And they, they said, I don't know what this is. I said, no, it's, it will shave, shave your head. <laughs> and so they, they gave that to him. Uh, Deepa Ma came. And I did some filming of Deepa Ma with my brand new $2,500 video camera, which is the worst quality ever. But you can see those videos on YouTube of Deepa Ma um, attending this little lunch given by my former teacher in San Francisco. Joseph is there. Um, uh, Bonte is there in his cool 
get up and a, a number of other people are there. So Deepa Ma was there with her daughter and with her daughter's son. So there's like three generations there. And Deepa Ma was, you know, we know we all know Deepa Ma, right? Yeah. So she was there and she was very small. But she sat on that couch in a in a cross-legged position, just so quiet and so serene. And so um, she was fed a, a lunch of black-eyed peas and ham. Uh, well, I, I think, I'm not sure if, yeah, there was ham, there was uh, cornbread. It was like a Southern lunch. She'd never seen anything like that. She she was pointed out the microwave, you know, this is a microwave and it cooks things. And she's like, what? And she's just toured through the electronic things that we had here. But then, so she we had lunch and we said, oh, do you want some ice cream? Ice cream. Okay. Okay, and she she ate some ice cream, and well, what do you think? Oh, it's good, yeah, it's good. Mm. So that was that was uh, part of the journey back then, seeing all of these people um, uh, in the vipassana community in that world. Um, so okay, so that that's just a little bit more about Bonte and goings on. Mm. What else? What happens now with Damasuka? Well, it's been happening. Uh, Bonte, probably it was January of 2022. He just, I think we spoke some health crisis and things just didn't get better from there. So since that time, and it's been, uh, what, a year and a half, we've just been continuing. We've built more cabins. We just, uh, we've hosted Delson twice now. Uh, retreats uh, in the last few years have been five to 10 people. The, we just did a retreat. We built a bunch of new cabins. Uh, we just did a retreat with 24 people. Um, so we're just continuing along. We just, some people come and some people go. We continue the practice of tranquil wisdom, insight, meditation, and whatever we can do to help. Is there a new abbot now or CEO or how has that leadership yeah. changed? Yeah, not really. We have two monks that support us um, very much. And we haven't gotten to the point of whether we're going to have a new abbot or not, but it's, it's kind of on the table, but we're doing it more of a layperson's meditation center for now, but uh, Bonte Kusala, who came in 2013, he's at a place called the Peace House, and he was with um, in Toronto with Saranapala, uh, and Ajahn Brahm, and a number of other people. He's a great supporter of ours, and he was here, and he'll be coming back for September to do the uh, ordination or to do the memorial for the stupa. Um, he's very, he's an expert on twim, and he knows the process. So he's a big supporter. And then Bhante Satchananda in New York, who is actually has the Brahma Vihara Meditation Center uh, in Westbury, New York. Uh, he's a big supporter. He's been out here. So we're, and he came and did a ordination in May of 17 monks and nuns here. And so we had the biggest ordination. I asked him, have you ever seen anything bigger than this? He says, no. We ordained 17 monks and nuns. We did alms rounds. Um, I don't think there's been any bigger ordination in the US, um, but it's great because you can see some videos of these lay people that were lay people and they're just going around with their bowls and we're giving them food. So it was really quite wonderful. We're trying to keep the monastic tradition alive. We want to be as close to the Buddhist teachings as we can possibly be. And that's why, you know, Bonte declared Theravada, yes, but there was 18 um, sects that came out of Theravada, and one of those was Suttavada. And I found this in my research. I found, you know, there was a Suttavada sect, and there were three things that they, they followed. They accepted the suttas as the teachings 
They accepted the Vinaya as the teachings. They did not accept the Abhidhamma as coming from the Buddha. So that's a controversial topic. Some of the Abhidhamma does not match the suttas. But in any case, they didn't accept that. They also thought that there was some sort of, it wasn't a soul, but it was a pugala, kind of a strange thing where it was an impersonal um, impersonal energy going forth. And then they they thought that you could have two Buddhas at the same time. These are just minor things. So we said, okay, we're Suttavada because we do the suttas and we do the Vinaya. And those are kind of our main books. And um, so the so we're trying to maintain a very much a tradition that is based on only the suttas, um, staying away from commentaries um, as best we can. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're where we're we're at. Wonderful. Okay. Well, let's pivot now to your life and practice. You are from Bellevue near Seattle, Washington. Yes. Wondering, yes. yeah, could you say something about the context of your upbringing? You, you mentioned that at 19, you um, engaged on that first retreat, you, you wrote your first retreat, a 30 day retreat. Yeah. In, in Colorado. But what about before that? What was the context of your upbringing, your, your family of origin, etc? Oh, I grew up in a, you know, a, a middle class, my dad was Boeing engineer, 35 years on the job. Uh, my mom was a school teacher and a choir master, and they both were very much into music. So I was brought up in a music, drama, theater uh, background. We had a very nice house that was on the lake. So, you know, I, I can't, my mom was an amazing cook. So, you know, when they say that people of merit, they're reborn into a house that where every, you know, they always get their food and they're friendly people and they, they get good things. I think it was, it was good. It, it wasn't, you know, rich or anything like that, but it was a nice upbringing. I went to Bellevue High School and I, I started to get interested in, the first thing I was interested in was hypnosis in high school. And I, I thought that was just the most interesting thing. Um, so I bought through the mail. Everything was done through the mail. So, you, you know, you want to buy something, you, you write a letter or you fill out order forms and you send them in and wait. And so I got a, uh, is, is a 45 RPM um, hypnosis record. And so I, cause I had a record player, you know, I had the Beatles and, and I had all, you know, the music at the time. I love music. I played in a, 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 a band as well. I think you play guitar, right? In a band? That's right. Oh, I play guitar too. Not as good as you probably, but but I had fun doing it. I see your guitars all in the back there. So is that a Les Paul back there? or? Um, well, actually. Or is, oh, no, no. That's not a guitar at all. That What is that? There's a mandolin there and there's a Martin acoustic. Mandolin, yeah. Okay. And my electrics. Now, are did electric. did you play electric? Yes, huh? I was. Uh, yes, I played Stratocaster. That was my electric. You, uh, I uh, oh, the Strat. Yeah, it's over here. I, I showed oh, you. Okay. Okay. Is it blue? <laughs> no. Oh, perfect. This was my working guitar. All right. All right. <laughs> I had a little, it was like a Stratocaster Jr. It was, uh, I can't remember. It was like a called Mustang. I, I can't remember something like that, but I actually designed a uh, synthesizer uh, before there was anything like Moog. I was, I loved electronics and I would, I had circuit boards and I was hooking them up to speakers and, creating these crazy sounds with potentiometers and volume controls and putting capacitors in. And I had, I could create all of this sound uh, out of it. So, and then I'd run the guitar through that, you know, and, and just create all this crazy noise. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I did drive my neighbors crazy, but so I had to keep it down. But um, 
Anyway, I got into hypnosis. For the life of me, I could not hypnotize myself. But later in college, I could easily hypnotize, hypnotize anybody. I could, one guy, I, I put my hand on his shoulder and he just, because I gave him uh, a, um, you know, suggestion that later when I put my hand on his shoulder, he'll be completely asleep. And, and I could do that. And it, it really works. But I could never do it, and I, and I didn't, you know, I didn't see much more than um, it was interesting. Um, and uh, so I went to college. Um, I did a lot of humanities, English, theater. Uh, I even wrote a play that was produced uh, by the college. Uh, I went to Evergreen College in Olympia. It was kind of a new age type of place. There were no grades. Uh, it was programs. And you, I was in a humanities program and then a theater program. It was a very cool place because there was, I mean, you, you would never see things like beer. You'd saw, yeah, marijuana was around. And people were very much into, this is like uh, 1972. So, People were just into that world. Uh, people were getting their work done. You know, I got my work done. But there was a little bit of LSD involved. And uh, I started reading the Carlos Castaneda Teachings of Don Juan. Amazing book. And there's a whole bunch of books where he goes out and he meets, uh, Carlos Castaneda go, goes out and meets the sorcerer Don Juan in the Sonora Desert in Mexico. And that's... I mean, they talk about uh, taking their peyote and then seeing other worlds and other dimensions and the idea of the the seeing, all in capital letters, you see something, you see the nature of it. So that uh, that was very interesting. I was very kind of skittish with drugs and things. I only took a little bit just to see what it would do. I never really got that much into it. But that led me to think, there's more to life than just this mundane existence. And there is. And of course, we all know that. Um, so I went to the bookstore and I was looking around and lo and behold, Paramahansa Yogananda, you know, the book that everybody's read, I think, uh, on uh, Hindu um, philosophy and the spiritual practices and his teacher, Sri Yuxtawar, Yuxtawar. And all of the powers that he had, and of course, that all powers, oh, that was very interesting to me. And so I started reading that. I even sent away for the Kriya Yoga course, but it's a mail order course. You, you know, everything's done by mail order at that time. So you'd get lessons every week. Looks like my internet's unstable. Okay, there it goes. It's better. Uh, so I did some of that. And uh, after that year of college, they said, we think that you need to go to a different college because we don't really have anything to offer you. We, we're, you know drama, you know the theater, you know what you're doing. You need to you know, get, get more involved in some higher level school. So I, I signed up for another school, which was kind of an Ivy League school called Whitman College. And this is where my parents had gone, you know? It's like an Ivy League, you know? And I got there and all people did was drink beer, you know, Friday nights. It was get drunk and the people were completely different. And I freaked out. I said, I cannot do this. And I just got on a, I went to the admissions office and I said, I need a, a cancellation form. I'm leaving. They said, nobody leaves. There is no such form. Well, I want a form. And so they created a form and I got it and I filled it out and I quit. And I went home. It was a seven hour bus ride. And I showed up at my folks' house and they couldn't believe it. I just quit their college. And so I had a kind of un, uh, unsettled number of months. And I, they said, well, either go back to college or go get a job. So I signed back up for Evergreen. But I said, no, I'm not going back to college. So um, the Still Point Institute had moved to San Jose. So I went to San Jose and I, I left all the college stuff and I went there and I uh, worked there as, uh, as 
the meditation, helping the, with uh, helping Sajata and helping the meditators and meeting all these people. One retreat in 1977, I cooked for 30 people, came in, came, coming up with all these wonderful recipes. And that was a lot of fun. I even got, gave a talk, went on for three hours. People must have been bored to death. But uh, anyway, that was my first talk there. So that's a little bit of my background. I don't want to rehash anything else. Um, but I just kind of gradually stepped through from maybe about 16, 15 or 16 to interest in, in meditation. And so at 19, you know, that year after my first year of I've only done one year of college, that after that first year, then I did that retreat. And I came back and uh, I started reading the suttas and I read all the suttas and uh, the suttas kept talking about jhana. And I was told by Vipassana people, don't, oh, you shouldn't, don't do jhana. That's very dangerous. It, you might get attached. So I didn't do jhana. So I did Vipassana. So I went through the Vipassana world. I can tell you something about that if you want to hear it. I can tell you about my experience in Vipassana. Yes, please. That was going to be my next. Oh, question. you you had a lot of experience in Vipassana and did a great deal of practice. Actually. Yeah, I did. Most of it was probably not useful, but there was <laughs> some of it. You tr you tend to be told you got to try harder, and well, try trying harder makes your mind very tense and, and it upsets you. Some people can do it. And they know how to relax. But no, all I knew was like type A personality, get this done, going to try harder. So a lot of times I'd be very tense. I was not on my breath at all. And I'd come in and out and do all this. But I've done three-month retreat. I've done a number of one-month retreats. Uh, the retreat with Joseph retreat. Uh, the last retreat in 1989, I did was Usi Lananda. Uh, Bonte's teacher and Mahasasayada's right-hand guy. And this was in Orinda, California. He's a wonderful monk. You know, he's uh, he was a great teacher. However, I still tried too hard. And I went through some of these insight knowledges a little bit. I went up to maybe the third insight knowledge. I, I was, you know, it's very well laid out. There's Seen insight knowledges, and they're very clear, and everybody goes through them if they can get get through them, and they will experience exactly what it does say, what the book Practical Insight Meditation does say that you experience. And so the last retreat, I had put it two or three days aside just to chill out, you know, at my condo, and uh, and so I went there and I started to just sit. Because now I'm home. I, there's no stress. I, I don't want to leave. You know, I want to just really just see where this meditation goes. And so I sat. And I remember I was sitting on the floor. I was sitting on a bench, a little these sitting benches. And I was with my breath. And all of a sudden, there was this vortex that started. And it started spinning. I, I, my eyes were closed, but I just knew that something was going on. And there was this tornado. And I opened my eyes, and it, and I exploded into sparks. And the whole, it was like in the air. There was all these sparks and energy, and all of this. And wow, it was something. And I had relaxed. I'd finally just let it be. So this kind of opened this door to all of these insight knowledges. And so I continued to uh, sit and actually I, I sat and then I thought, you know what, I need a little break. I'm, well, let's see. So I think what first happened was the uh, insight knowledge of arising and passing away. This is the fourth insight knowledge. Joy, a lot of joy, mind is brilliant. It's, it's um, happy, it's clear um it's not cosmic or anything it's just clear and and bright and i sat for a while and then the little 
the corruptions of insight came and there it's just like the book the buddha there you, you saw i saw these little buddha images and they're going across the screen of my mind and these all these little images and i thought oh that's that's the corruptions of insight and so i noticed those and i noted those and that all kind of passed away and then i thought you know what i I'm going to take a break. I went to the beach. I went to Santa Cruz. I went out to a kind of a very desolate beach out there. Well, as I was going out there, now this practice is just going. I walked out onto the, the, the sand and all of a sudden things are starting to dissolve. And when I hear things, it just goes, you know, like I was hearing the wave come in and, and it was just, uh, just, phew, and uh, I'd say something, there would be this echoing. And even my thoughts, I think something, and then it would just kind of echo away. And there's, I believe it was this fifth stage of uh, dissolution. The things are dissolving. Everything's just disappearing. So that went on for um, maybe a few hours, two or three hours. And um, then what happened, and I can't remember the exact everything that happened, but I was walking along the beach. Then I felt this depression, this, this, okay, wait a minute, let me kill that one off. Okay. And I felt this heavy feeling of suffering. And I believe this was the stage of suffering and I was walking, I was doing my lifting place and putting on the beach. I was doing the meditation, but I could just feel the weight of the world and that this feeling of everything was is dukkha, it's suffering. So that went on for some time. Um, and then it kind of went away and I went back to my condo. And I was sitting that night and then all of a sudden, fear arose and this is the insight knowledge of of fear the yana uh, knowledge of fear and i was afraid i was going to die um i was sitting there and i thought i i, I was completely terrified and i thought i don't know what to do i'll just continue to sit and see what happens and i was there for a, an hour or two and then it disappeared and I was just, you know, kind of backing away as I could. I was still taking it all personally, you know, <laughs> uh, backed away. And then that disappeared. And then this um, this equanimity came. It was the, the Sankara Upakinyana, just perfect equanimity. But this is around midnight now, and I'm starting to feel tired but energized and i lay down on my bed i actually went to sleep I was completely aware while i was asleep and I, I didn't realize the sleep until i kind of quote woke up but my mind was completely just nothing bothered me whatsoever and um so i sat some more and all of a sudden i heard uh, there's this blackout and i you know, I don't know what it was, but just, and I thought, oh, what was, was that, was that the thing, you know, was that it? So I, I sat some more and I noticed all this joy starting to come up. And actually it started coming up and I got up and I actually had pains on my arms. It was kind of, something was happening. I got the book out and it said, oh, joy can arise, pain might arise at that period of time. So that, well, I wonder if this is it. So th then everything just calmed down. I mean, I got, you know, went to sleep and, and everything kind of returned to normal. About, but three days later, I went to see a friend and I had this outpouring of metta that's unbelievable. I was almost not even here. It was just a cloud loving kindness loving everybody and i told him i had this wonderful experience he said oh wow i think you've done it so i don't know but maybe there's no teachers around to tell me but um so and then i went back to my job and everything 
went on. However, I, my mind would kind of go through these these states every now and then. I'd be walking down the street, and just everything would be get very quiet. And it, it just it was just for a few years, it was just kind of going in and out of stuff. And I thought, you know, I, I wasn't meditating that much. I, I would sit occasionally, but um, after some years, I thought, and it just kind of disappeared. And I thought, well, okay. Uh, I went back to doing some more meditation, but nothing was really working. So I just kind of gave it up. And then around, see, this is some years later. Uh, and then I'm kind of in a world of a couple of years of, well, I, you know, I'm not sure what to do next. Um, but so I kept reading suttas. I kept doing things. And then I met Bonte and kind of that was my next, my next step. And he said, well, that was wonderful. It sounds like, you know, you went through what I went through, but I've got something more for you to try. So that's when I tried his, his way of meditating. And would you say that that experience that you've described was stream entry? Was that crossing the stream as far as? It far... seems like it. It seems like it. From the books, it, I don't remember this reviewing knowledge but everything else really matches the book. I think I've left out a couple of knowledges, but um, they were, they all just happened one after another. Um, but I, I think it was, but uh, I guess in the end, whatever it was, my ego reasserted itself. My personality came back as I thought, I believe that I had experienced something, but, you know, looking back at it, I had gone through what appeared to be kind of like a, a, a close to an LSD kind of experience, but it wasn't. It was it was something that happened um, in the mind because you do this practice and you focus on the breath. Something happens, and it seems to happen for many people. But evidently, that was it. But later, I realized that that was not that was. I don't believe that was stream entry. That was a experience, uh, a blackout that happened, but it was not, not a real stream experience. And what led you? What's led you to that conclusion? Well, since I've been with Bonte now, I know what stream entry is. I mean, I I know what it is. I've seen people do it with this practice, and where he is added this tranquilized step to the meditation. This has changed everything. And that's that's what I outline in the book, is that the jhanas that you hear about, concentration jhanas, there is concentration jhanas, but there's also another type of jhana. It's, I call it the tranquil aware jhana. And so there's two types of jhanas. The first type, everybody knows, is concentration. Now, vipassana is a kind of concentration. You, you focus on your breath. You focus on your walking. You do sweeping. You focus on vibrations and things in your body. And you that will develop, uh, you'll develop uh, one point in this. And you'll have joy coming out. And you'll have what appear to be jhana factors coming out. That's all well and good, but they've been developed differently. They've been developed by focusing the mind and just kind of pushing the hindrances aside and not letting them be there and releasing and relaxing. That's the key. So when you release, when you see a hindrance come up and you release it, you release your attention to it. You don't bat it away. You release and relax any tension and tightness that is still there and just accept that, oh, I have some, uh, let's say, some doubt in my mind. Am I doing this right? Release, relax, come back to an uplifted mind, smile again, and come back to your loving kindness. When you don't, when you make the hindrances your friends, it changes everything. The hindrances no longer uh, are your enemy. Now you're, they're your friends. And you know what? They're not interested in being friends. So after a while, they just disappear. And instead of trying to hold them at bay, 
they just go away. They're not interested. You don't give them the fuel anymore. So this is what we call the six R's. Recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return to the object meditation, and repeat. And this is what Bhante found out. And uh, I can go through this whole system if you want, or you can direct me to some other way to talk about this, because I don't want to launch into a long Dhamma talk unless you want to go there. <laughs> I think it might be interesting to outline TWIM and differentiate it from other types of, of practice, but I'd, I have a few questions before we do that. Yeah. Of course, all this and more is outlined in your book, Path to Nibbana, mm -hmm. and very clearly, actually, and there's there are detailed explanations as well as summary explanations. And That's testimonials. Yes. Testimonials from people who have experienced everything. I put them in the book. So what is the difference then in your experience and observation between the sort of stream entry, if we call them both for, for, for the purposes of, of uh, calling them something, the kind of stream entry that you initially had, the, the stream entry that's not a stream entry, the kind of LSD trip uh, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. experience, the and blackout, really. The, it's a blackout it, that we're, we're, yeah. Let's call it a well, blackout. What's the difference yeah. between a blackout stream entry, so to speak, and the kind of stream entry that you experienced when you began to, and you've observed when you began to work with Bhante Vimala Ramsey? Yeah. Well, the Vipassana is about concentrating and focusing your mind. And you do that by keeping the hindrances away. You don't want to look at them. You see them, you note them, and you are focused on an object. Now, you're, the definition of mindfulness in this case is being mindful of an object. So you develop a very powerful concentration focus on an object. Now, you can develop jhanas, you can develop, you can use that um, to look at things, but Keep in mind, and, and the first thing that happens is access concentration, where no hindrances are arising. And you think, oh, wow, wow, no hindrances. This is great. Well, you know, well, let's just stay on the subject of what the, the difference is. So there's no hindrances now. Now these other experiences are starting to come up. Um, but they're based on not, they're not based on seeing what's happening. They're based on pushing everything away. So in the Vipassana world, you have this blackout experience. And believe me, I'm going to get into trouble if I talk about this. People are going to go, oh, he doesn't know anything. Well, I experienced some of these things. And I know a number of people have experienced it. And, and it is different. And all I can say, tell you is that the blackout in the Vipassana tradition seems to be just a blacking out of the mind um, into a neither perception space and not a cessation. I think it's a it's a the eighth jhana of neither perception where there's nothing there, but the mind is is still there. It's a very deep, but the difference between twim and that is that with twim, you're now letting each hindrance go to the point where it goes to the uh, where the mind gets so quiet and it becomes the stilling of all formations and not by pushing them aside but letting them just disappear when there's nothing left there's no ripples in the lake the wind is stopped the craving is stopped then the mind just stops and there's no movement of mind. The mind moves because there's craving going on. There's constant, the mind is constantly looking here. You know. So the meditation is about letting the, that craving go. The jhanas are about each jhana you successively let go of a layer of craving to where at the neither perception level, the mind is barely there. But there's some little bit of uh, movements and vibrations and you observe those and you release relax let them be 
and there's no fuel now keeping the mind going. And at one point, the mind just goes, whoomp, and then comes back. And then you come back into reality, and there's a lot of joy that comes up. And you might see something like bubbles, like patterns, um, crystalline, all kinds of different things. And so what you're seeing is the beginning, the very beginning of that arising of the links of dependent origination, which is how your mind works. So the difference is that you're letting go and the other is concentration is holding on and getting focused. And they do two different things. Now, looking at what the Buddha talked about, if we go back to, if you take your hymnals and we go back to Sutta 36, uh, as it's in my book, the Buddha said, I went to Alara Kalama. This is his path. The first thing is he did meditation. The second thing he did asceticism. I went to see Alara Kalama. Alara Kalama taught me to the seventh jhana of nothingness. Now, keep in mind, this is a Hindu yogi, and this is concentration jhanas. This is what's taught in India. And this is what subsequently, like Yogananda, all of these cosmic states of consciousness, they all turn out to be states of jhana uh, as concentration. He got to the seventh stage, and Alara Kalama says, oh, you are so great of a meditator. You stay with me. You will help You help me teach. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. I think there's more. He went to another teacher, Uddharamaputta. And this is in the sutta, the story. Uddharamaputta taught him how to get to the, the highest jhana of neither perception nor non-perception. And he did this through... Uh, you know, different concentration techniques. And when you use concentration, you, you can use casinas, you 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 see infinite space, you see this, you expand this, and you do all of, all of these different things to get to this. So he did all of that, and he says, well, this is interesting, but it doesn't answer my question. It doesn't get uh, eliminate craving. I don't it I don't think I've gotten the the, the thing yet. So he left. He said, these meditations make the mind unstable, restless. My energy is not balanced. And so therefore I am going another path. And he tried for another six years doing ascetic practices and holding this breath and um, uh, standing on you know one leg or and putting his arm in the air, just all these crazy ascetic things. And then he realized that doesn't lead to anything. He was down to eating one rice, one grain of rice a day. And he was on the verge of dying from hunger. And the story is that the Deva said, no, this is the Buddha. We cannot allow him to die. And they said, they told him, don't, don't do this or else we're going to infuse Deva, uh, Deva food into you and we're not letting you die. So the Buddha realized, okay, 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 I'll, I'll stop. And then he, he, he went to the the Ganji, uh, to the river, and uh, a lady offered some milk rice, and he took the milk rice and and he ate that, and he felt so much better. He thought, wow, now I feel really good. Maybe this asceticism is not good. So, and this was right near Bogaya. And I, I've been to Bogaya, went out to the tree where, where he was sitting to get the milk rice. It's not much of a river there anymore. There's no water. And then he went over to Bogaya and he sat under the tree, the Bodhi tree. And he thought, what have I done wrong here? I am not enlightened. I am not, I have not accomplished what I need to accomplish. And he remembered when he was probably eight, seven, or eight, or nine, or something. He was with his father, who was, who was the king, and his father, you just stay there and you sit here on this sofa, and I need to go to this fair, and you just stay there for the day. And he sat there, and he started to just meditate on his own. And he, he meditated, and he allowed his mind to be completely relaxed, and he entered into a jhana. 
uh, he wasn't concentrating on anything. His just mind is just naturally went there because he had no, not trying to control, not trying to meditate, didn't know what meditation was. He was eight. Uh, I don't know what yeah, real uh, age was. But uh, so when he was sitting there under that Bodhi tree, under the rose apple tree in Bogaya, he remembered that. And he says, that state. And then he relaxed his mind and he brought up that state. He said, oh, this state of complete relaxation, of, of smiling, of happiness, of being content, rather than seeking, I have already here. And then just looking at the mind, he successively went through four jhanas. And he became the Buddha with that, you know, making the long story longer. And he found that what he'd done before was not the path but that he found a different path. And that path is outlined in Sutta 111, the Anipada Sutta, the one by one where Sariputta sees each mental factor as it arises through the jhanas. And that sutta explains what we're doing, this twin path. It explains uh, what arises in each jhana, the characteristics. And the funny thing is all of these jhanas they're very, they're much lighter, but they have all the same characteristics of the concentration jhanas. So people say, well, oh, that's light jhana. That's not real jhana. Well, I don't know. Which one is the real jhana? You know, will the real jhana please stand up? Um, no, it is a real jhana because it leads to a mind that is very happy. And you see insights and you go through these jhanas and it changes your personality. You ultimately get up to the path and you do experience the cessation of mind. And when you come back, you're a different person. You've let go of a lot of things and you have to go through this a number of times and you get rid of a number of fetters. So long story, that is the difference between um, concentration and the twim. You're concentrating and the twim, you're letting go of things and you're not fighting them, you're letting them. It's more like Vedanta, accept, accept what is here. But it's also adding the step of tranquilize. Tranquilize, believe it or not, is in the Satipatthana Sutta, where people say, well, Satipana, Satipatthana is the basis of Vipassana and the way the Buddha taught in Theravada. Well, yeah, but it's the basis of also twim, because it says you tranquilize the bodily formations. The bodily formations can be t tensions and tightnesses in the head and in the body. That's created by thoughts. That's craving. People say, oh, well, of course. Well, that's just tension in the body. We all say to relax. No, this is much more subtle. Yeah, you can relax tensions and tightness in the body. But when you get to the fourth jhana and there's, you're, there's no real body left, the body's there. You notice, You know that it's there. But when you are at a level where you're only in mind now, now there's only just tensions and tightnesses that it seem to be mental. And they're part of your body. You, you feel like something from your body, but it's really in your mind. And you want to release and relax that and come back to your meditation object. Now, the Satipatthana Sutta says you tranquilize bodily formations. The Anapanasati Sutta, believe it or not, has got the real secret. It's right there. It says you tranquilize the mental formations. Have you ever heard anybody talk about that? What do you think mental formations are? They're thoughts. So when a thought comes, you tranquilize it. And the Pali is pasambaya. Tranquilize. That's what Bhikkhu Bodhi came up with the word tranquilize. So when your thought comes up, you tranquilize that thought. You release it. You recognize your, your mind's over here. You recognize, you release, you relax. Take a moment, accept that it's there. Come back, bring up a wholesome, a wholesome object, your metta, your 
feeling of love and kindness. That's right effort. So now I've just described right effort. You see something that is unwholesome. You recognize it. You release. You let it go. You bring something up wholesome and keep it going. That is what the Buddha taught. And that is how you do it, is you tranquilize and let these things go. You don't push them away. What's pushing away? It's controlling. It's with more craving. And so accept everything. And when these thoughts come up and you accept them, they just disappear. They go, you know what? I'm not, I'm not wanted here. So I'm just going away. And your mind goes, it just automatically just goes, and the jhana state arises. When you do this, it's a lot faster. I mean, we're used to having people uh, leave our retreats uh, in the fourth jhana. Now, again, this is these jhanas are different. So um, some people go much higher than that. Some people go all the way just in one 10-day retreat here. So it's very effective, which leads me to another thing. Sometimes people practice concentration and they get into trouble. I talk to people on Zoom quite a bit because people say, I've been practicing kundalini yoga and I felt like I went crazy. And there's all these electrical the things going through my mind, this energies and um uh, I, I feel uh, restlessness all the time. There's this energy in my eyes and I have tremendous headaches all the time. And this is a real thing with concentration. You have to be careful with this and, and maybe just let it go completely. So we have to come back and say, okay, let's release, relax. First of all, our reactions to that. I hate it. I don't like it. That's craving itself. And then let that uh, tension, te uh, headache, be there. And so a lot of things, people get themselves into a lot of trouble. Uh, they try way too hard. They, Ruth Dennison, who we went out there to do uh, Bonte's retreats, we got to know Ruth pretty well. She was a Vipassana teacher, but she also had been broken by doing a Zen practice. If you read her book, uh, she had a uh, personality disintegration when she was doing Zen meditation. And as a result of that, uh, she opened the center where it would invite people that had been kind of wrecked by concentration meditations, Vipassanas, any, anything at all. She would bring them in and they would do movements. They would do very light meditation. And um, so she's very well of, aware of of this so there's a, there is a lot of people who deal with these problems that are being caused by this meditation and you you can go to the cheetah house if you have problems go to the cheetah house you steve you you know about the cheetah house right yeah yes uh will it be britain yes will it be britain yeah i was uh i was watching uh some or watching a seminar uh uh, on psychedelics with them just a few months ago. Evidently now, there's a whole different world now of people using psychedelics um, to try to change their personality as therapy and this kind of thing. And they're being told that if, see, to me in the 80s, if you had a bad trip, it was a bad trip. Not your fault, it's drugs fault. Maybe you're in a bad setting, set and setting, that kind of thing. But you know you were you had, you you had a drug and it wasn't your fault. Well, now it's your fault because the, the psychedelic, and the the psilocybin, the whatever you take, it's fine. It's fine. But if you have a problem with it, you need to work it out. Well, now people are having real problems and they're going to a place like Cheetah House to see if they can get further uh, counseling therapy because they've had some really bad trips and they're really messed up. And so now everybody's seeking help with that. I don't know, maybe we're in a different, we, we seem to be in a microdosing world now where everybody's microdosing this and that. Uh, we've Maybe we're leaving meditation and we're going back into psychedelics because I'll tell you, meditation in the last number of years has 
gotten very lightweight, you know, watch your breath for five minutes. That's meditation. Or one minute, the one minute meditator. Well, that's not really that helpful. Um, apps, you know, you know, do your meditation on your app. And I think maybe people are not getting much benefit. So now they're looking for something else. So that, it just seems to be a, a new trend uh, that's happening. I, have you seen that? Yes, I think I think there has certainly been an uptick in psychedelic use and different sorts of substances, ayahuasca, DMT, and mm -hmm. so on, becoming ever more popular, microdosing becoming de rigueur in many circles, and for all different sorts of reasons. Yes, I think I think that's right. I don't know about the the meditation. The, the, having become light, it's certainly become proliferated. Maybe that means, I'm not sure what, the, the, if the volume has increased, maybe the concentration has decreased to use concentration in a different sense. Well, but, I th well maybe perhaps it's <clears throat> more, people are not going to retreats that much anymore. They're using their five minute apps. Um, it's uh, more about stress reduction and it's not about enlightenment. And maybe enlightenment's not even on the table anymore. It's just um, feeling better, being stress-free, having emotional upsets. It's in place of therapy. And, you know, I noticed the uh, magazines about uh, mindfulness. Of course, mindfulness has become very secular meaning there's the Buddha has just been left out of the idea of mindfulness. Um, I, I looked at a mindfulness magazine. I didn't even see any mention of the Buddha or his philosophy in there. Seen a cup, Buddha, Dhamma, tricycle. I, they're just trying to, they think that nobody, oh, we don't want to talk about the Buddha. That's like religious or something. Um I know, and now when you take the Buddha out of the equation, what do you got left? You you're trying to just use the practice that's left, and without filling in all of the background, you have a really diluted process here. And you're now you're really, I mean, you've given up the idea of enlightenment and sotapanna and saktagami and and real achievements of mind, getting rid of hatred and 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 sensual desire forever. And you're 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 just you know using a, a I call a lightweight kind of mindfulness. And it really isn't right mindfulness. Mindfulness as the Buddha described it, and Bhante described it, is is watching to see how the mind moves, watching the attention of the mind moving from one object to another. It's not focusing on an object. And what you do, though, it's not, you're not just doing that, because that's just release, relax, release, relax. That doesn't work. The Buddha's system is very specific. You have to have an object, and then you have to watch the mind moving from this object away. That moving from here to there. What is it moving? It's moving to a thought. Oh, I wonder what's for lunch. I hope the lunch is really, uh oh, I'm off my object now. And re relax, come back to the objects. Watching this process. What is this process? It's craving. The first noble truth is dukkha, suffering. So what is enlightenment? What do, what's the problem we're trying to solve here? Steve, let me ask you this. What is enlightenment? Well, of course, I can describe enlightenment as it's defined in various systems, I think, including TWIM. But I myself am not enlightened. I don't claim to be. So I'd have to answer that question as I don't know. That's the quick answer. But then the nice answer that mm -hmm. I sometimes feel if I want to get out of that, answering that question, is a story that um, Shinzen Young tells. Mm. Uh, on one occasion, he was on a Japanese TV show, and he was there when he was a monk and there was another uh, sort of, in, you know, he head monk was there as well. And then there was the Roshi. The three of them were on this sofa 
And the host said, turned to them and said, so at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, what is enlightenment really? Just like you asked me. And he asked Shinzen. And Shinzen turned to the head monk, passing it along, you know, turned to the monk, Roshi. Yeah. Mm. And then the head monk turned to the Roshi. And of course, in Zen, this sort of a question, one's expected to come up with something. Yeah. You know, Pythian profound. Very cosmic, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, or insightful, or profound, or cutting yeah. through. This is mm -hmm. a wonderful Zen tradition of this. Yeah. And the Roshi said, well, I guess you could say enlightenment is the passing away of the distinction between enlightened and not enlightened. That was his answer. So sometimes if you ask, you know, if somebody asks me a question like that at a dinner party, which occasionally someone might, I'll tell that story. And then I will, then I will say, or before I will say, as I've said to you, I actually don't know <laughs> what enlightenment is. I don't know myself, but I like that tale. So, okay. So now you're going to tell yeah, me, you know, you know what that, what that is, uh, Delson did a talk, uh, on the, the views, mm -hmm. uh, all the, the various views, uh, you know, that there's fate and that we're headed toward this. There's no stopping it. There's, you know, basically is, is there a God? Is there not a God? There's this, um, uh, type of, uh, view that's called eel wriggling. That means you wriggle your way out of any of saying that anything is any way there's actually a whole uh a group of people during the buddhist time that were eel wrigglers that they didn't want to commit to anything it was like agnostic um and so that was they were attached to that view <laughs> you can be attached to anything you can be an atheist and be attached to being an atheist and really believing it and you're no longer open to me, agnostic, maybe, you know, is there? I, I don't know. It's just kind of an I don't know until you do. Um, but I think that's a it's an ill wriggling view, uh, a way to slither out of it. But, you know, also the word enlightenment conjures up this cosmic um, state. And maybe we don't want to do that. Uh, I know Bonteville Moramsey would say, ah, oh, I don't want to. I, enlightenment's not a good word. Uh, if you tell tell me something about this, then I I've, I'm enlightened. I I the light is on. I know now what you mean. I'd say it's awakened. Uh, enlightenment is awakening, and that's more about you know the, the bodhi. Uh, the it means in Pali awakening and awakened one. And so the the Buddha. He had to ask himself, well, what is what am I seeking and why am I seeking it? Uh, well, what are we seeking? Are we are we seeking experiences like cool jhanas to hang out in? Um, are we seeking what aren't we seeking happiness? Aren't we seeking the end of suffering? So yeah, that's what we're all seeking. And we're seeking things to make us happy cool states cosmic states well that can make us happy doesn't make us happy forever though it doesn't change our our, our. so we seek drugs we seek all of these different things i mean you, you've heard the sensual pleasures the mind is always seeking something but it never lasts so maybe the whole problem is that the mind is seeking and that's the problem it's craving. So there's the four noble truths. The Buddha said, the problem is that there's suffering and that my mind is constantly seeking. I don't get what I want. I get what I want and then I don't want it. And then I somebody takes this and I have, a, I have hatred. I have anger. I have lust. And these things are fiery in the mind and I feel bad. And maybe the what I'm seeking here is a way out of all of this suffering. And so the answer is suffering is the problem that enlightenment is fixing, awakening. And crave, well, that's the result. Craving is the problem 
the second noble truth, second noble truth, first noble truth, suffering, second noble truth is craving, third noble truth is cessation of that craving, or tanha in Pali, the fourth noble truth, eightfold path. In other words, how do you get out of this suffering? How to eliminate all of the neurosis, all of the hatred, the anger, the constant seeking for sensual desires, the inability to be happy right here, right now. That's all. All you have, we're just looking to be happy, undisturbed, at peace. Peace is the highest happiness. Upeka, equanimity. It's the Buddha. If you look at every Buddha image, there's a little smile there, but he's also equanimous. Nothing bothers him, but it's like, yeah, everything's good. But it's not a big joy. It's not this, not going up and down, but it's a constant happiness, loving kindness, mindfulness, all wholesome states. So enlightenment, to me, and I think the Buddha says this, is the elimination of the 10 fetters from the mind. Hatred, greed, delusion is the three main ones, and then everything comes off of those. Fear, no more fear, no more anxiety. This is all part of craving. And when you start to learn how to release and relax uh, these states of mind, you eliminate all of that craving. The fear goes away. The, the anger, the hatred, you learn to let it go. And pretty soon it doesn't come back again. So to me, that's the, 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 that's what we're seeking here. So we have to know the problem first. If you want to go seek the Kundalini, fine, go seek the Kundalini, but, you know, be careful. Delson sought the Kundalini and he said he, he got, he said he got burn marks on his back from all the energy that he was producing. So, and he says, you know, that, that was interesting, but you know, I, that really wasn't what I was really looking for, but it was quite interesting. So be clear about what you're looking for and find a path that you know leads you in that direction. So so I'm very curious. Thank you for that um, summary of the of Twim and the, your approach. In in the book you write, the practice of tranquil wisdom insight meditation is new in the sense it has been rediscovered in the suttas. It's not practiced very widely, uh, which seems rather surprising. In fact, Venerable Bhante Vimalaramsi and his approved teachers are the only ones who teach directly from the suttas in this way. Others reference the suttas, but don't follow them precisely. Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation Twin is the actual and correct application of right effort. This is the reason for its resulting success. Mm -hmm. So I am curious, you, Mentioned before, you met people like uh, Munindra, you met Deepama and many other teachers. And some of these uh, names that you mentioned previously are, are uh, revered as mm -hmm. having attained various levels, but, uh, you mm -hmm. know, first, second, third path, fourth path, who knows? Mahasi Saido, etc. These are generally revered teachers. They weren't doing TWIM. No. So how does TWIM and the rediscovery of this way of working that Bante Vimala Ramsey made and that you're now discussing, how does that, what light does that cast on the attainment of those kinds of teachers? Um, well, you have to question it. You have to question it. How did they get to their whatever they got to, their levels of attainment. What was the path that they did? If you don't release and relax thoughts and, and uh, hindrances, and you're, not, you're, you're practicing mindfulness in a different way, you're going to get a different result. You know, people say, well, you know, all these paths, they all lead to the same place. Well, no, I mean, I can get a map out and say, well, does this road lead to the same place if you go that direction? No. Um, so 
all Buddhism doesn't lead to the same place. It leads to wherever you're going and whatever practice that you're doing. Now, I have on cassette tape Manindra's Enlightenment Experience. And um, because I was there when he talked about it in uh, California, I recorded all of his talks. And I loved his talks. They went on and on and on, but he it was always great. But he talked about one day, he had this experience. He, he was sitting and he sat for eight hours. And all of a sudden, there's just, just this tremendous joy came up. And he thought that that was, that was the enlightenment experience. There was probably more to it. But he basically sat for all this time and he got up and he thought, well, he's, that's, that's his experience. Um, so that's really all I know about that. Um, he was a Vipassana teacher, clearly. Um, he did lifting place and pudding. He taught, you know, in and out breath in the Mahasi system, you know. So uh, Deepama, well, Deepama, okay, she's she's there. She's not she's not here anymore. So I guess we can talk about her. I'll get in trouble, but um, she's theoretically an anagami, third stage, has no lust, hatred. Uh, that sort of thing, not an arhat. And she's an amazing lady. And I said earlier that she was an amazing lady and she has a lot of stories. And you can buy Amy Schmidt's book on uh, the legacy of, of Deepama, a great book. And I even, I gave some stories that I had had with Deepama to her uh, for the book. I don't know if any of them made it in there, but um I thought, you know, it's interesting because Deepama practiced with Mahasi Sayada. Now, how could she be an anagami if she's not practicing in the way, uh, you know, that was taught by in the suttas? And she's practicing this system that came about that originated with Leti Sayada. And then, I mean, this was this was created, this, this insight knowledge. This, none of this is in the suttas. Actually, there's only one sutta, number 24, which talks about purification of view, purification of vision. And to me, that sutta shouldn't be there. There's some other people say, I think that was added. And somebody just threw that in there because that's about insight knowledges and they don't match what the suttas say at all. Insight knowledges in the suttas is the jhanas. Those are the insight knowledges, the first through eighth jhana. Uh, but in any case, so back to Deepama. So how could she be an anagami if she's doing all of these different? So I read stuff. I talked to people. And finally, one time I, I was searching the internet. I found an article where she was interviewed uh, by maybe, a tr well, tricycle. I'm not sure. And they said, oh, so you're, you don't have any hatred anymore. And she said, oh, no, no, I have it, but I can control it. I said, whoa, wait a minute. I took this to Bonte. Bonte thought, yeah, she must be an anagami. I showed it to him. He says, what? Anagamis don't have hatred. It's gone. It's eliminated. It's just not there anymore. They don't have a version. So at that point, yeah, I thought, okay maybe she's not where she is. But she was an absolute master of the psychic powers of the jhanas, in the concentration jhanas. So I'll say that. So you have to look at what people are practicing. Now, I, I don't know for sure. I'm not a Buddha. Only a Buddha could figure out where these people really are and also themselves by how they're... The way that you figure out how your mind works is... How you react to things. Do you have any hatred? Do you have anxiety? Do you have fear? If you do, then they're there and it's okay. You have to go back and practice and you have to be honest with yourself um, and continue. Um, and I guess that's all I would say about that. What do you mean when you said she was a master of the 
powers of the second jhana, the second concentration jhana. What do you mean by that? No, I mean powers? master of. Oh, I'm sorry, psychic powers. Hmm. Master of psychic powers. I mean, she would have. Menendra said that she would have appear in front of him, she, coming up out of the floor, and her hair would be a little wet because she had actually turned the earth element into water. I don't know, it'd be kind of cold, but in any case, uh, she'd just and be up here. And I think he said, don't do that. It's like really uh, uh, surprising to me. Um, my old, my original Vipassana teacher was there with her in Calcutta. And he's he's very blunt. And he's, he's like, I, I want you to demonstrate psychic powers. I, I want to have something. And Sujata was there, and, and he had actually visited Mahasasayada and taken eight millimeter uh, uh, footage of him, which I got a hold of and I converted to uh, video and uploaded that. So there is video of Mahasasayada doing his walking and meditating. Sujata told Mahasasayada, I want you to meditate and I'm going to take film. So he did. Uh, so that's up there. Um, so he has some pictures of Deepama, but he asked Deepama, he says, I want you to do something psychic. She said, okay, like what? Um, do you want me to materialize something or, or tell your future? Or, um, well, for some reason, I, I thought he should have said, create an orange in my hand, but he didn't. And he says, I want you to tell me my future. So she pr proceeded to tell him, this is 1969, that he would create a meditation center in Colorado, that he would eventually move to California, and there would be a, a center in a couple different places in California, and that, you know, and he, she filled in some details. And he says, okay, well, I don't see how that, he was in, he was from Florida, and I don't see how that's going to happen. But it did. It all happened just like that. And that was all done in 1969. Um, and she was asked, well, how, how, do you, how do you predict the future? How do you go back in time? She said that she would sit at the foot of the Buddha. And she said she goes back mind moment by mind moment. And then she gets right there and she can just be there and listen to the Buddha's talks. But the ability to forecast into the future is she just looks at the causes and conditions and sees based on that, that will happen based on this. It's kind of a dependent origination and see how it all play out. Now, I, I've never seen anybody who's done it perfectly. It's very hard to predict the future. Most people, they predict it and there's nothing ever. I've never seen anybody actually any really good predictions and actually 10 years later you go oh wow they actually got it right so it must be a very hard thing anyway she did predict the future um she was she could read their minds she could just envelop their mind with her mind um anyway you read the book and so there's just a few things that i know about um the funniest thing, though, was when she was, well, this is in the book. I'm sure everybody's read it. But when she was flying from India to here, they they saw that she was um, resting. And they said, oh, were you in Naroda? Were you in a cessation? And, and she could do that. She could go into a cessation type state. And she said, yeah. And they said, oh, well, we want to do that. How can we do that? And she said, oh, you want to fly and, and just, you know, go from place to place? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, let's, can we fly? He, she said, well, just buy an air ticket. That'll, that's easier. Other way, very hard. Um, but she did have a lot of power. She was able to stay in the cessation. And I don't know whether it's a suppression of mind, which it could be, because in the fourth jhana a uh, realm there are eight different realms well there's 31 different planes of existence but in the uh, fourth jhana the brahma loka where you go if you have the fourth jhana 
that you've attained the fourth jhana, there is a realm where you are, it's like all of these meditators, they're standing around like statues. And there's like other devas, uh, angelic beings taking care of you. But what you've attained, you're in the fourth jhana and you've suppressed the mind completely. Now, instead of just suppressing the thoughts and being on an object, your, your suppression is on suppressing the mind completely and all consciousness. And you can be there for up to 500 mahakapas, which is just a long time. And so there is a realm where you can learn how to actually just turn it off. But it all comes back on. And in the suttas, it talks about this, and it says one of the dangers of this concentration jhana is it's wonderful. You will be reborn in a heavenly realm, but when you come out of that realm, you may be destined for a lower realm, not even the human realm. And I know we had a meditation teacher here. He said he remembers in a past life that this happened to him, that he had practiced some yogic concentration. And uh, he was in this Brahma Loka, this, this heavenly world, and it was wonderful. But he um, died, and he ended up in a hell realm. And he was there, and uh, he remembered this, and, and he was just amazed. <laughs> went from this incredibly high realm down to this low realm. So, you know, you have to be careful. You, you have to realize, you're, you, you know, you might get some merit, and you might get into a higher realm, but at the end of that, you're going to come back. So do something that gets you off the wheel, gets you off the wheel of existence. You know, enter the stream, enter the stream to the, to the, the final Nibbana. Um, so well, I got off on a tangent there. Well, it's very interesting indeed. So by this uh, definition or in this context, there may be an awful lot of people walking around who've had what you would describe as the blackout stream entry and think that they've had stream entry. They think they've entered the stream. Maybe they even think that they're second or third path mm -hmm. and they are not even, they haven't even begun in some senses. No, but it does turn out that some of those people who come here, they experience the meditation very fast. They know discipline. They know how to sit. And all I have to do is just add those six R's, just add the release step, and they, their mind just goes. What are the signs that someone might recognize if they were first, second, third path, if they believed that they were? in this sort of blackout style, okay, in the other style, for want of a better word, um, what are the sorts of signs or niggles or things they might see out of the corner of their eye and might bug them a little bit about what they'd achieved and make them perhaps even wonder if it was real? You know, when people come to you, what, what are the things they report? What are the sorts of things that might give someone pause uh, to wonder if, if they're really where they think they are. Maybe their teachers have told them where they are. Maybe their students have told them that they're a certain place. But what, what are some things that they might be able to notice that might make them think, according to your presentation? Well, I, you know, I really talk to that because those people won't probably talk about that sort of thing. Um, all you can do is ask them, how is your mind? Has it changed? Um, if they're at a first stage of sotapanna, I mean, there's two parts of this. There's the path and there's the fruition. And each time you experience Nibbana, you go through one stage. And at the fruition, that locks in the sotapanna stage uh, forever. You know, you no, never regress. Uh, you give up the three fetters, you know. Uh, you no longer have any doubt in the Buddha. You, know, you don't have any doubt in the practice that you're doing. You no longer look for other practices. You think about it, but you go, eh, this seems to work. So you have confidence. 
And the other one is rites and you think that rites and rituals will lead you to Nibbana? No, you know that they don't. That incense and praying and all of that stuff. You got to do the work. You have to meditate and follow right view and the eightfold path. Um, and that kind of person, you'll find um, they're following the five precepts. That would be a definition of somebody who's a sotapanna. If this person is going around drinking, um, lying, stealing, killing, wrong sexual misconduct, any of those things, they're not a sotapanna. So you have to look at their actions. Um, if they do any of that, they'll have a huge amount of uh, remorse and then just never do it again. Because at first, you're like, I don't know where you're really, I'm really at here. And you might be tempted to test. But if you do, you're like, oh, no. <laughs> no. You know that precepts, following these five things of not killing, not stealing, wrong sexual act activity, lying, harsh language, intoxicants. No microdosing, please. No, no, no drugs. No need now. You know, those things uh, lead to enlightenment. They lead to awakening because they keep the mind calm and tranquil. When you don't steal and kill and rob and rape and do all those things, your mind is happy. You know, you first of all, you're not in jail. You're not in prison. You, you have no worries about anything. So that's the first step. So that's the sila. That's the morality. So Soda, Sodapana is going to be keeping... Yeah, I'd say you know ninety nine percent morality. Um, so and and they'll be convinced. So Saktagami is a second stage. They're going to have a path and a fruition. That's a person who's going to be still have anger. Uh, that you might insult them, and they'll get oh come on, you know what what's wrong with you, you know, and they'll get a little angry, but they'll just drop it, forget about it. And it's just not going to last. It's not somebody who's going to walk around. I did. That person called me a dirty name, and I'm going to get them. And I'm just, no, that's that's anger that keeps going. They're going to think about it and go, ah, that's nuts. Um, so their hindrances, their fetters, their uh, lust, sensual desire for food, for sexual activity, uh, prone to anger, fear be much reduced, a lot reduced, not just like a little bit, a lot. And then the third stage, Anagami, there will be no more real sensual desire. It doesn't mean you're not going to enjoy your food, but you're not going to go off and think about, uh, oh, I'm going to go to this place and that place. And I'm going to, you're not always thinking about all this stuff. You just enjoy what's here in the present. There's pleasant feelings. There's unpleasant feelings. When pleasant feelings arrive, arise, you are you have pleasant, a pleasant feeling, and it's good, but you don't dwell on it. You don't take it personally. You're not attached to it. So the anagami uh, is not attached to things like this. Uh, they don't have any fear. They don't have any hatred. And it's just something just disappears. It's like, huh, there's no hatred. There's no aversion. I, you know, you don't get upset at things. And it's just it's not like you're some cosmic being floating around in a cloud. It's just like your therapist finally got you cured. <laughs> <laughs> finally, after 2000 sessions, you're cured. No more neurosis. Now, that's the third stage. The onigami, that's a lot. There's, a, there's still this craving, this tanha that's much deeper. And it's uh, restlessness is part of that. Uh, the constant like moving and wanting to do things. Um, sloth and torpor, prone to just a little sleepiness and to meditate. That's going to be gone. You'll just... Um, the, the, there's desire for existence uh, where you're thinking about what you're going to do next. That, that desire for heaven and for earthly just this constant kind of becoming and um also this conceit this i you know that there's no i 
and you don't take anything personally, and you're just pure. Again, not a cosmic being running around in this bubble of bliss. It's just a very, you'll never know that this person's an arhat unless you really notice that they're just calm, relaxed, happy, and that's it. They're just cured. You know, the Buddha said that craving is a, it's a poison, it's a dart, it, it's an infection. And Delson was saying, it's a virus. And what we're trying to do is take the antidote and eliminate it forever. Uh, but the arhat is a lot harder to achieve. The, in the Dhammapada, the Buddha was asked, why are there so many Sotapanas, Saktagamis, and Anagamis? And there's not so many arhats. And there's only one place in the suttas where uh, he's asked that, uh, that, I, that I can find. Uh, maybe somebody else has found it. But it was in the Dhammapada. And he says, oh, these Sotapanas, uh, Saktagamis, Anagamis, they're beginners. <laughs> beginners. They're just learning the practice. To get from that stage to anagami, it's like first, second, third anagami. I mean, arhat, fully and fully uh, awakened, all the fetters removed. That's a big leap, and so there is there's quite a bit, quite a bit of difference there. And I, I think we we do see that in the meditation that people don't, they don't. Well, we don't see arhats, so uh, we don't know why. Uh, people can do all three stages. I mean, it will take a number of retreats, and there's not a lot at that higher stage, but it happens. But people beyond that stage, the the funny thing is in the suttas, it says that an arhat must have must be in the robes to become an arhat, or once they become an arhat, they must go to the purity of the sangha. And there's three different places where it does say that, that a householder cannot become an arahat just as a householder. An, an arahat is very pure. They don't want to be involved in worldly things. You may not recognize them, but if you say, oh, are you going to get a job? And no, 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 the arahat's not going to, he's going to go and find a, a sangha, take on robes and, and, and help people like that. Uh, so that's you know that's the difference. Um, these other the people that have had these blackout experiences, uh, whatever experience they think, they have to look at their minds and see if that's true for them. Now we have run across some people who have done other practices that have somehow slid into an experience of nibbana. They relaxed and let go at just the right moment. And it happened. It's very rare, but it does happen. Um, so I'm not saying it's not possible. But as soon as you start trying and controlling and making things happen, no, you're not, you're not, you're not doing it. You're letting the mind calm and then disappear. And Nibbana arises. You wrote in Path to Nibbana, changes mm -hmm. have been made. Changes have been made in other practices to allegedly improve upon the Buddha's meditation mm. instructions. But hold on, he was the Buddha. Is it not just a little bit presumptuous to think that the instructions of a Buddha can be improved upon? After all, he was indeed the supremely awakened Tathagata, perfecting his wisdom over countless lifetimes. So you've been differentiating Twim as a sutta-based practice different from many of the other meditation practices that are also under the umbrella of Buddhist practice, such as, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. Mahasi Saido's practice and so on, as it's known. Mm -hmm. um, what went wrong? Why was Oh there my goodness. So what, many why, things went wrong. <laughs> why was there a departure from those original teachings if they were so effective? Why did these other less effective teachings come in? and begin to be accepted, if we take your premises as the case, as, as, as the Buddhist path? Well, it's really quite easy to, to address that. And the fact is, if you, there's uh, the, the councils, uh, the five councils that went over the last 2000 years, 
those councils were the things that addressed keeping the Buddhist teachings pure. And 90 days after the Buddha died, uh, Mahakasapa said, um, you know, without the Buddha here to guide us on what to do with each rule and all these things, um, there's nobody in charge to tell us. Um, the Buddha said that my teachings are the guide. And so he said, we have to memorize all of these teachings and um and we're going to get Ananda. And that's a whole different story. Ananda had a photographic memory. He remembered everything the Buddha said. So Ananda repeated everything that he heard. And, and each monk would take different parts of these suttas and memorize them. And they would then start memorizing and start reciting and passing these down as a oral tradition. They realized things were could possibly change. And by the first uh, Buddhist council, a hundred years later, things had gone off the rails. There were now monks that were not practicing what the Buddha had taught. They had decided that they knew better, that they wanted to do different things, and that these rules were not really that effective. So as the Buddha disappeared into the rearview mirror, Everybody decided that they had improvements and they didn't need that rule or that rule. So you had the first Buddhist council where they decided that uh, gold and silver was okay, that a monk could uh, accept that. Uh, you could keep salt in your kuti. <laughs> uh, you could, there's 10 different things. I don't remember all of them. Uh, so that then there was a big meeting, and the arhats were still in abundance, and they said, no, we're not doing that. And these monks said, okay, then we're going away, and we're doing, we're creating our own sangha. This was the first schism of the order. Very bad. So they went away. And so 100 years later, there's people uh, changing things. And so, I mean, I don't really need to say that each council, there were more disagreements. Uh, I went with Bonte to, in 2000 and, uh, 15, 16. Um, anyway, I went to a World Buddhist Council in Japan. Uh, Bonte was the representative of the U.S., um, to the Buddhist council. Bhikkhu Bodhi had said he didn't want to be involved in it. And Tanasiro Bhikkhu said he didn't want to be involved either. And we found out later why. It turned out to be really the, the Nishiren Buddhist sect had invited 32 different countries into Japan, this beautiful place. And we talked about the original Buddhism and we wanted to keep the teaching pure. But it really, we didn't really talk about that at all. It was a lot of ceremonies and a lot of rites and rituals and tours of monas of temples, and it really it didn't help the Buddhist cause. Um, we did take a little cruise around um, Japan, and we had a meeting with these thirty-two different countries. Now we were talking Vajrayana. It was MTV, Mahayana, Theravada, Vajrayana. Everybody was different, all different robes, lay persons. The, the, and the whole room was full of all these different people. And um, actually, uh, Bonte and Sister Kema, uh, one of his, his chief assistant, had asked everybody to come together and say, what do we all know about the Buddha? What are we all teaching? How can we come together to teach the Buddha's path? And so she put out the question, what do we have in common with the Buddha? What does everybody here, what are you teaching? Well, no, or what it was in common with everybody here? What, what do you have in common with your fellow Buddhist? Well, nobody could answer that. Nobody said anything because, you know, the Tibetans had their practices and the Mahayanas had their practices and the Vajrayanas had the Taravan said, we had our practices, but we're all doing different things. And finally, Bhante Vimla Ramsey says, how about the Buddha? 
we have the Buddha in common. And I really, oh yeah, it's very good. But we didn't really get much farther than that. So uh, Buddhism is so many different things. Why is it there? Because people think that they can improve things. They think that they understand that teachings better. Uh, Vipassanas, I went to my, you know, when I was in San Jose, uh, my teacher had all the sutta books on the shelves. I said, did you read all those? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. D it, we're matching, right? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Well, later on, we didn't match the suttas. We we're teaching a different pract practice here. We didn't do jhanas. Vipassana doesn't do jhanas. So everybody says, yeah, no, the suttas match. And they'll they'll take out certain quotes and they'll say, this is what the Buddha said. And we'll all agree. Yeah, that's right. But if they're not practicing in the right, they're not practicing right effort, they're not practicing what the Buddha taught. And that's the key is, are they practicing right effort? Or are they doing something else? So they're staring at a candle, doing a casino, uh, expanding things in their mind, um, going and, and looking at corpses and, and doing uh, asuba meditations. Um, I mean, the practice every day that somebody's doing. Um, but, you know, they're being created all the time. So that's how things got different. Bhante went back. He The story is he got the suttas and he read that this tranquilized step and he started walking down the road. And as he would, he was just, his mind would start to think and was I'd ruminate and ramble. And then he would release and relax that thought. And, he, and then he would try it again. Wait a minute. My thoughts are stop, stopping and have these quiet spaces. Maybe if I brought that to the meditation and I stayed on the object of breath, he started with breath, and release and relax, that is the key. And he found that that was the key. We had another monk here, uh, actually another layperson from Australia. He came here without knowing anything about Bhante and knowing anything about this. He had figured this out too. He took the suttas and he tried this relaxed step. And he tried it, and all of a sudden, these this the state of the first jhana arose, and he had some joy, and there was this different. And he said, "I don't, I don't know what that is, but I found this bloke Bonte Vimala Ramsey, and he was talking about what I'd found, and so he immediately flew over, and did a course, and said, Ah, well, wow, I found this on my own, but uh, it looks like Bonte Vimala Ramsey beat me to it." So, and he became a monk and uh, did the practice quite successfully. You'll see in some of our very old videos sitting up on the podium. Um, so that's that you have to find the path for yourself. We have to find it. And then when we find it, we'll know that we found it. And in the, in the, in the end of the path, the Buddha says that there will come a point at, at, the, at the final Nibbana where you know that you've done it and you've done what needs to be done. You've cut off the palm tree at the stump. Nothing will grow any further. And your work is finished. David Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.